Lord, we give you honor. Lord, we give you glory. Lord, we say that you're worthy. And just all over this place, just begin to, to raise your own song to the Lord, for he's good, he is worthy. But you're worthy. Last Wednesday night, we were, we were on vacation about 2 o'clock in the morning. I, I woke up, I couldn't sleep, and I was just like, Lord, just speak. And uh, so I went in and I sat out on this balcony, and I was sitting there, and I was just thinking, and the Lord said, just pick up the word and, and go to Revelations 4. And I was like, all right. So I picked up the word, and I went there, and and, and as I read this, this is beginning to give you a picture of what heaven looks like as the angels are there and the 24 elders are there and they're, they're worshiping and you, they begin to say, worthy, worthy and holy, holy. And I begin to think, what if, even TW, it was like the segue into this, is that what if we knew what was on the other side that was worshiping the Lord right now? And we could see into that and and we get this glimpse in Revelation 4, and I just want to read this, and it says, And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated upon the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him. Who is seated on the throne. And worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast down their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive all glory and all honor and all power. For you created all things, and by you they exist and were created. So Lord, I pray right now in this room, Lord, the name that's above every name, his name is Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would look down upon this place and that you would see that there are people hungry for you, but Lord, that your name is exalted above every name in this place. So let's just declare this. It's Revelations 4. And you're worthy of it all. And you are worthy of it all. And from you to And you deserve the glory. Just sing that out.
deserve the glory. Your name is like into this but here's what I felt I heard the Lord speak to my heart I think in moments like this we can 
we can say, God, you are worthy of it all. We, and, and in our mind, sometimes the easy place to go is you're, you're worthy of my praise. You're worthy of, of this worship. You're worthy of, of my time. But sometimes there's a disconnect between the things that are, that are hard to give. I felt like the Lord says that, that he is worthy. He's worthy of you casting your burdens on him. That he's worthy to receive even the, the places of hurt. Because really that's why he came. He, he came to take, to take and to set us free. And it's freedom from the past and freedom from sin and freedom from shame and, and freedom from all of these things. And, and I think that it's like, God, you're worthy to receive my praise, but I'll hold on to my shame. How worthy is he, friends? Do you trust him? Do you trust him with the good? Do you also trust him with the stuff that, that man has been an inhibitor for you, from you, of stepping into the freedom that he's paid for you to walk in? He's worthy. So I just feel like right now that God wants to do some, some heart work in some people. So everyone in here, would you just take a step of obedience and simply just with heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just put your hand on your heart? And if you believe it, you are worthy, you are worthy. Would you just say this, say, Jesus, you're worthy to have every piece. You're worthy. Say it with me. Say, you are worthy. Say, Jesus, you are worthy to have every place and every piece that I've tried to hold on to. You are worthy to have the hurt, to have the pain, to have the sin, to have the shame you have come that I would be set free and whom the son is set free is free indeed this is my reality and so I declare you are worthy I give it to you I choose to give you it all because Jesus you are worthy. You are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all right now. You are worthy of it all. Oh, we lift a voice of freedom. You are worthy of it all. thank you father that you have provided a way for us to walk in freedom haha <laughs> ha. 
you have provided a way that we would walk in freedom. Jesus. You are really, really good, Lord. Just minister, Father. Holy Spirit, just begin to stir. Bless you, Lord. I love the picture that was expressed in the word that day and night and night and day, the eternal response of those positioned closest to him is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You are holy. Just begin to tell him how holy he is. Just say it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You see, he's eternally seated on the throne in heaven, but... He wants to be eternally seated on the throne of your heart. So that every part of your life would respond as you see His glory. When you see Him, the only thing is holy. This is where He's calling you. Not where he is just added into your life, but he becomes the object of your life. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. One more time. You are worthy of it all. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy of it all. From you. From you are all. You deserve it, God. You deserve it. So, Lord, we just look to you. And I say, keep and take that position of being enthroned upon my heart. Forgive me of the times that I have tried to place other things there. I repent of those times and I just say, Jesus, take your rightful position. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, 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 amen. God is good. If you believe it, say yes. Oh, he is so good. All right, guys, would you uh, help me welcome Pastor Bo up to the stage with us? And uh, that is so sad. Can we please really welcome Pastor Bo to the stage with us? Like, we're happy that he's here. Come on. God is good, and I know that he's got a word for us. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been a hard burden to bear being the older brother, but also the better-looking brother of the, of the two. But, uh, but <laughs> he, he will argue that quickly, I'm sure. The devil is a liar. Come on, <laughs> but, but, man, Bo, we're excited to have you with us, excited for the word that you have. So, man, just, just let it go and bless us, buddy. Love you, man. Love you, brother. Come on, somebody. Give God some praise. Oh, I got a bunch of PGA golf clappers in the place. Come on, somebody. I said, give God some praise. 
There we go. That's a little better. That's a little better. This is an honor uh, to be at Little Chapel. I love getting to come see uh, family. We got to chase some whitetail in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. It was a blast. Um, it is. It's an honor to get to be with you guys, man. I love seeing what God uh, is doing in and through this place. And, and he's just getting started. Look at your neighbor and say, he's just getting started. Come on, man. Has, has, has anybody had a great 2020? It's been awesome for me. My world has, has looked a lot different than I'd hoped, but it's been great, right? Like, I got a, as a pastor, I got a six-week vacation. You, you had an 11-week vacation. Did they pay you the whole time you were on vacation those 11 weeks? They sure did, yeah. Uh, man, it's been crazy, y'all. Like, for real, everything that I hoped for, everything that I was planning for uh, changed for me. Probably you too, huh? Like, like, is anybody going, I don't know what 21 looks like. Are you a little bit like, like you're a little kid walking down the hall, you're trying to get a snack, hoping your parents don't see you. Anybody else do that? Tevin and I played this game when we were living in Oklahoma. So you'd have been five and I'd have been three. And, and in our living room, in, our, in this house, there was a, a doorway that led to my parents' bedroom and our bedroom. And we woke, we, we didn't wake up, we just didn't go to sleep. We, we got up out of bed and my dad was watching TV and we played this game where we would sneak back and forth across the, the little hallway till one of us got a spanking. Come on, somebody. That's what I feel like going into 21. Am I right? Like I'm trying to sneak through praying that something doesn't spank me. Am I right? Y'all know what I'm saying? That's how it is. We're going to be in Timothy today. 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 6 and 7. Let's pull that up. Here for, here's what it says in verse 6, New King James Version. Therefore, I remind you, I love the verbiage, man. I love the poetic language right here of the New King James Version. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. You got to read that in a little bit of a Pentecostal voice, am I right? But of power ha, and of love and a sound. My, am I right, somebody? I love this setting of Scripture. Timothy is this young pastor, man. He's this young pastor, and he's got a ton of people. Some some uh, scholars think that his church had about 12,000 people. And, and matter of fact, I was talking to one of my elders the other day, and he said, Pastor Bo, I think the, the last church is going to be like the first church. And I said, I think you're right. Come on, somebody. There's people meeting in homes. There's, pe there's mega churches. I think that's the way it was then, and I think that's the way we're going out. Come on now. I think that uh, uh, the reality was this was Timothy, man. Timothy's this young pastor, and he's got hundreds and maybe thousands of people. They said maybe 12,000 would have been the largest. If it were today, it would be the largest church in the world, right? And so Timothy is stressed out, right? Because he's got, he's got liberals in his church. He's got conservatives in his church. He's got Chiefs fans in his church and even had Raiders fans in his church, right? Like he's got all these. He's got this vast array of people that were coming to try to have an encounter with God and he didn't know how to handle it all. He's going, he's talking to Paul and he's like, Paul, I'm going to quit, man. Paul, I don't know how to handle what's going on. Paul, I wasn't ready for this pandemic that was going to show up in 20. Come on, somebody. Paul, I don't know how to handle the divisions and the racial stuff going on in the culture. He's telling Paul, he's going, Paul, I'm going through all this stuff and I don't feel equipped to handle it. Y'all, I love this setting of scripture because I feel like Timothy. Come on, somebody. I was talking to a mega church pastor friend of mine. He's, it's a huge church. And we were talking about how they were doing through all the COVID stuff. Right? Also, I love the fact that people blame everything on COVID now. Like, I was going to do the dishes, but with COVID. <laughs> right? It cracks me. I really don't like people. Like, I just, anyhow, I could go all day on that. I was, I was going to go. I was going to get an oil change, but pff, COVID happened. Motor blew up, COVID, you know. <laughs> I was, this was the year I was going to be a better husband, but with all, with COVID, I'm, I'm going to keep being an idiot. <laughs> Come on, man, I'm talking to this pastor, and he's going, telling me everything that he's facing. And then I talked to this pastor in Africa that literally lives in a tent in the bush that pastors. And it's, it's magnificent because the same thing the pastor in Africa that lives in a tent was facing was the same thing the mega church pastor was facing. Come on. Because what we're dealing with is not a COVID issue. It's not a political issue. It's not a racial injustice issue. It is a humanity issue. 
That's why Paul's encouragement to Timothy can help us today. Timothy's going, I'm struggling. And Paul's writing to Timothy. And I love where he starts this setting of scripture. He goes back a few verses and he says, listen, I know your mama and I know your grandmama. Come on, somebody. He said, you come from a lineage of faithful and, and believers in the way and believers in Christ Jesus, man. He said, you, you were raised right. Come on now, somebody. He said, you were raised in a way that you know where to lean when you want to quit. You know who to turn to when you want to give up. You were raised in away when other things were trying to take the altar of your heart you kicked them off and said no 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 only one name is worthy come on now see I love this setting of scripture because he says before I talk about anything that you're that we're gonna deal with I know that you know where to go and what to do I love this setting of scripture Paul is going, Paul's going, now listen, I, I, you, not everybody, not everybody is, 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 a lot of people in your church are first generation believers, but not you, Timothy. You ain't got no excuse. You know what to do. Why aren't you doing it? He says, I think that, I think that it's important for us to understand that it is our job as parents to hand the baton to our kids further along than when we got it. Come on, somebody. Man, I don't want, listen, I'm so thankful. My mama, her mama was saved, right? My daddy was a first generation believer. He led all his family, uh, most of his family to the Lord, right? If he wasn't saved, my mama would have had nothing to do with him. Come on now. Come on now. And, and that's what happened. And the reality is I'm so thankful that they raised Pastor T.W. and I in a way that we knew to love God and to serve God. And we've discussed a lot how we are so grateful for that. But even with how great they did, our goal is to make sure that our kids are further along. Come on, somebody. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. And then he goes into the setting of Scripture right here. And he says, listen, I want you to stir up the gift of God which is in you and that's so cool because that word gift literally in the Greek there is the word charisma it's where we get like the charismatic movement right it, it, it literally is the word charisma which are you ready for the definition of charisma gift <laughs> man it's so good it's so good man the definition of charisma literally is is gift it's a literally a divine grace to do it's an extraordinary power come on somebody so understand what he's saying Paul's going Timothy's saying Paul I want to give up Paul I don't know how to handle my wife am I talking Paul I, my, my boss I just really want to punch him right in the mouth and he deserves it Nobody. Okay, we'll move on. Maybe it's this way. I want to punch this employee right in the face and they deserve it. He's going through all this stuff and he goes, Timothy, I need you to understand something. There's a divine grace inside of you and when you don't feel like it, I need you to reach down into the depths of your soul and pull out the giftings that God has put in your heart. Hello, that's right. Come on, somebody. I love it, man. It's a divine grace to do. I'm so thankful for these divine graces. I'm so thankful that there's a divine grace in each and every one of you to do something that's extraordinary, above what you could even think you could do. Problem is, we just bypass right by them. We're so busy, we walk right by them, right? Matter of fact, Paul would go on in another book, and he would talk about the, the gifts of the Spirit. I feel like in Pastor Chibber, you can get up and correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, wouldn't be the first time. Come on, somebody that you've... Just kidding. I, I think that the problem that we have in the church world is we think the gifts, of, the gifts of the Spirit are reserved for Sunday. And I feel like they're more about Monday than Sunday. Right? We, we want the gifts of the Spirit to flow in the church. And matter of fact, and I, I don't know of any situation, so if this is your heart, this is between you and God, you may be thinking, why isn't this happening in the church? I'm going to call TW and ask why we're not seeing this gift. Probably God's wanting you to operate it on Tuesday. Right? Probably he's wanting you to flow in some gifts in your everyday life because the kingdom of God is life and it's all things pertaining to life. Am I right, somebody? Right? The gifts of the Spirit. And really, really quick, the purpose is so that we can shine brightest for the kingdom of God. Really quick, let's run down them. Word of wisdom, that's a gift of the Spirit. Okay, very simply put, that's guidance from heaven. When you don't know what to do, that's the Holy Spirit giving you direction, wisdom on which job to take or not take. Come on now. It's wisdom on, on how to raise kids and how to raise each one of them differently. The next thing we see is this thing called the word of knowledge, okay? It's being aware of unknown things. Jesus would be teaching, and he'd be preaching, and in the middle of his preaching, it would say this, Jesus knowing their thoughts. 
and then he would speak to their thoughts. That's called a word of knowledge. Pastor Chebby operates in this all the time, and others do as well. So you've probably seen this happen in your church, right? When, when God speaks to you very specifically from someone, and you know there's no way they would have any clue. Then the next thing it talks about is faith. Did you know that you have faith, but there's also an extra, there's a, there's a charisma, a divine grace of faith? I have a pastor by his name is David Freck. You know Pastor David uh, in MFI. And uh, he, uh, he was a part of R.W. Shambach's college. Anybody know R.W. Shambach? And, and they had this thing called the power line, I think is what it was called. And if you were sick or, or if you had issues in your life or, or there were struggles, you'd call the power line. And one of his students would answer the power line. Hello, power line. And they would pray with you. Well, Pastor David Freck is man of the power line. Each student had an hour a week. He's man of the power line. This lady calls and she says, hello. And he says, R.W. Shambach, power line. How can I, what can I believe with you for today or whatever? And she said, well, my cat died. He said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, honey. Well, what can I pray for you about? She goes, well, I want you to pray to come back to life. He said, well, how long have you been dead? Uh, three days. I got it in a box. He said, so I opened my Bible, and I'm flipping through some words of wisdom because I'm thinking one, one less cat in the world is a good thing. <laughs> Tina didn't hear me. Come on now. I'm flipping through my Bible trying to give her some wisdom. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, don't you dare discourage your faith. I want you to pray. So he said, well, let's pray, honey. Bow your head. Jesus, heal her cat. Amen. So they were in the, every week they went through praise reports and he's in the, the room with all the other students and they're going through praise reports. Yeah, Betty Lou called and God healed her shoulder and, 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 and John Johnson called and he had lupus and he was totally healed and everybody claps and one of the students comes barging in and she goes, I, we've got something to talk about. And, and, and uh, R.D.B. Shambach said, what is it? Well, this lady called uh, yesterday and sure cat had been dead three days and she called and one of the people talked to her and he was like, oh no. She said, well, she just wanted to call back and let you know the cat was scratching at the door this morning. Someone said, you made it up. Y'all, it's documented. Come on, somebody. He said to this day, people still call him if their dog dies. Come on. Now, here's the reality, guys. There's something, there's a charisma, an extra gift of grace that is in some people. And it's the gifts of the Spirit. In this specific case, it's faith. Then there's healing. And then there's miracles like Jesus calming the storm. I've seen that happen in my life. Come on, somebody. That's a charisma, a gift that God has put on the inside of you. He says, Timothy, there's a gift in you. I need you to reach in and pull it out. There's a gift of prophecy in someone. Come on, somebody. There's a gift of discernment in someone. I was in this restaurant, and I'm walking in, and the minute I walk in, the restaurant was very spiritually dark, right? And I walk in, and immediately my stomach started hurting, and I was like, oh, God, I want to leave. Come on, you ever been there? Right? I was like, oh, I hadn't eaten yet, so it wasn't the food. Come on now. And I was like, God, I don't know what to do. I just want to get out of here. And I told the people that I was with, I said, I'm, I got to go wash my hands. So I go to wash my hands, and I'm just thinking, what, what excuse can I make to leave this place? I'm very uncomfortable. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart, and he said, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the restaurant. You're here. It can't stay. So I said, okay, in Jesus' name, you go. I get to be here. Come on, somebody. And immediately peace filled the atmosphere. And my point in saying that is it was discernment. It was Holy Spirit saying there's something going on in the spirit world that you can't see, and I want you to take authority. That's just simply a charisma, a gift on the inside of you called discernment. Then we have tongues, which is dialects. This is different from praying uh, in the spirit that we read about in Jude, right? This is, this is when you go to Russia. You don't speak Russian, but you start speaking Russian so someone can get saved. That's, that's, that's what it's talking about. Then there's interpretation of those tongues or understanding those dialects. But I feel remiss. I feel like it would be a mistake for us to talk about the gifts of the Spirit and exclude the fruit of the Spirit. Because if you have the gifts of the Spirit but do not operate in the fruit of the Spirit, I am here to tell somebody you are not full of the Spirit. If you have not love, you're nothing. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Listen, he says, I don't care if you're praying in tongues. If you can't love, come on now. If you can't love your neighbor that no one else likes. See, here's the reality. Within the church world, we've elevated gifts and said, oh, this is what it's all about. But we've, minute, we've, we've, we've brought the fruit of the Spirit down to a place that's just for, ki for kids' church. 
And the reality is, Paul is telling Timothy, there's not just a grace of prophecy inside of you. There's a grace of peace inside of you. So that when Corona is going crazy and you're stressed out and you're fighting with your husband, he says, I want you to reach down and grab the charisma, an extra gift of grace called peace. And you can sit back and go, oh, this feels good. Ooh, I like this. See, the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, truthfully, they go, go hand in hand. I, uh, we have apple trees. Do you guys ever go on vacation and someone breaks in and steals stuff? That's just me. We went on vacation, and we come back, and someone had taken all the apples off our apple tree. I'm not bitter, I promise. I assumed it was mom or, or Belinda, my, my mother-in-law, going to make us apple pie. Nope. Literally, went on vacation another time. I had all my silverware stolen. And all my underwear stolen. That's the gospel truth. I told them, whoever it was, I said, I put on the airwaves. You can have it. I don't want any of it back. That's the gospel truth. I wish I was lying. If I'm lying, I'm dying. It's funny, the apple trees, when someone was trespassing, <laughs> stealing my apples, the apple tree was like, hey, that's for me. Don't take my, the apples are for me. The apple tree produces apples for one reason, for the world around them. And you as a believer produce fruit for one reason, the world around you. Yeah. So you walk into the restaurant and there's, there's turmoil. You walk into a room and you can tell there's tor- turmoil between a couple. a couple. You're supposed to go, here's some peace. Oh, here's some joy. When that, when that situation, when, when, when that demon-possessed person cuts you off in traffic, you're supposed to say, here's some self-control. See, you produce fruit not for you, but for the world around you, which is the same reason you operate in the gifts. They're less for you and more for the world around you. See, Paul is telling Timothy, he says, God's put something inside of you, and now it's time to bring it back out. He's put something. I know you're stressed out, and I know you don't know what tomorrow looks like, and I know you're you're running between the two doors, uh, and and your dad's asleep, and you're worried you're going to get a spanking, and you're having a ball, and all this. I know that you're trying to tiptoe, and I know that you're a little concerned. He said, but there's something. There's a peace inside of you. There's a hope inside of you. There's 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 a courage inside of you. And he says, right now is when you need to understand You need to bring it back out. You need to bring it back out. The problem that many of us face in our life is the entire time we're going through hell on earth, heaven is in us, but we never let it out. The entire time we're facing these problems, the gift of God that is in, that is the right thing at the right time, it fits the need, it lays dormant because we ignore it. Right? How many sleepless nights? I was sleepless night one night, a year and a half ago. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, how long are you going to try to do this on your own? He said, when are you going to get away with me and let me bring you peace? Oh, not only was I encouraged, I was crazy convicted. Because I've been trying to carry what only the Holy Ghost can. I'm I'm, I'm reading this thing of Scripture. My heart has totally changed because I'm realizing there's gifts inside of me. There's gifts inside of you that you've ignored. Anybody going grocery shopping today? Anybody? Raise your hand real high. I want to see you. Come here. Come here. No, no, the lady in the very back. Very back. I'm sorry. No, no, you, yeah, you just turned around. Yeah, come here. Quick, 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 quick. You don't have to run, but you can run. I don't care. It's up to you. I want to buy your groceries. I want to buy you. No, come on. I want to buy your groceries. What's your name? Nicole, can I, can I bless you and buy your groceries? Would that be okay? Here you go. I want to buy your groceries. That's all. That's all. Now, uh, you, 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 yeah, you're welcome, girl. You. It's okay. Lord bless you. I'll say it's the first of many, man. Come on. Now, we got to buy Nicole's groceries, and I'm so thankful for that. That's so awesome. But my point in, in, in buying your groceries is if she calls Pastor Tedebu after church and says, now, Pastor Tedebu, I really need groceries, he's going to say, Pastor Bo gave you 100 bucks," And she's going to go, I know, and I'm so thankful. I about cried, but I really need groceries. And he's going to be like, um... I think you were praying about it, right? Yeah, I was praying, right? Yeah, yeah. Right before church, I was going, oh, I got to buy these groceries, and I got two kids, and, I don't, and all this stuff, and, and then and the Lord met your need, right? Yeah, he gave, he gave you 100 bucks. Yeah, yeah, he gave me 100 bucks. But the problem is I don't need 100 bucks. I need groceries. 
but don't you have 100 bucks? I put it in the safe. No one's going to break into my house and steal my 100 bucks. I know the combination. Can't nobody get in my house. I got the 100 bucks. It's safe. But the problem is the pantry's empty. God's going the whole time you're complaining, I've already put inside of you what you need, but you've been ignoring it. You said, God, I need peace, and he said it's in you. You said, God, I need hope, and he said it's in you. God, I need healing, and he said it's in you. Joy is in you. Come on, somebody. He's put in you what you need out of you right at the right time. But the whole time you're like, but, but I need it groceries. God's going, you're missing everything I'm trying to do in your life. I put something in you that can change your circumstance, but you ignore it. And because you're frustrated at the circumstance, you start blaming all your problems on everybody around you. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. He says, Timothy, quit being the victim. Church, quit being the victim. You are uniquely made. And when you, were, when you were uniquely handcrafted by heaven, he put the gift to buy groceries on the inside of you. And he paid the price on the cross. Come on, somebody. He paid the, he, he pay, he paid the price on the cross. He's looking at Timothy, and he says, Timothy, there's a gift in you. That will change your tomorrow. It'll change your today. Quit ignoring it. It's in you. Verse 7, so cool. He says, for God's not given you a spirit of fear. Right? A spirit of timidity. Listen, can I be very real? If this season you've said, I'm going to shrink back. And you've called it in the name of precaution. It's not precaution. That's fear. Now, there is precaution. I'm not being an idiot. Right? But I'm not, in this season, I am not running around licking doorknobs. Because I'm not an idiot. Right? But I'm also going to not do the things God called me to do just in case. Someone said, well, how have you traveled? I went everywhere God told me to go. And if you told me not to, I didn't. Come on, somebody. Right? Right? He says, when this, there's, some, there's a gift on the inside of you, but when that gift is in there and you're not sure what to do, he says, I need you to understand, you've not been given a spirit that shrinks back. You've not been given a spirit that says, oh, we're not going to make it if my candidate doesn't win or my senator doesn't win or, the, or, or a new person becomes the boss or, or whatever it is, right? He, he says, you've not been given a spirit that pulls away from the purpose of God. You're not been given a spirit of a uh, that, that pulls away from the plan of God or the vision of the house. Come on, somebody. He says, you've not, you are not, uh, the rest of the world does that, but you are not like the world. You, you're made different. Like Nellie said, you can tell by the way I walk, I ain't from around here. Probably couldn't tell because I ain't walking nowhere. Come on, somebody. I love this setting of scripture, guys, because he looks at Timothy and he said, he didn't look at him, he was writing a letter, but he, he's probably imagining Timothy. And he says, Timothy, you've not been given a spirit of fear. And then Paul gets a little Pentecostal and he says, You've been given a spirit of power. That word power is dunamis. You guys ever shot something with Tannerite? That's amazing because it blows up. What is it about guys that we just like to watch stuff blow up? Amen. Man, I don't have time to tell that story. <laughs> he says, you've not been given a spirit of fear, but you've been given a dunamis, a dynamic power for Sunday at church. Mm, Sunday because it's a day. But you've been given a dynamic power for your Monday. You've been given a dynamic power for your Tuesday. You've been given a dynamic power for your win. Am I talking? You've been given a dynamic power to, to go grocery shopping at Walmart. My God, especially in this season, amen. You've been given a dynamic power to serve on a serve team. You've been given a dynamic power to get in a group, come on, a connect group. You've been given a power for this. You've been given a dynamic power to, 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 to be a part of the, uh, what was it called? The fortress, you've been given a dynamic power to be a part of the fortress. You've been given a dynamic power that gives you the strength to make it through anything you are ever going to face. You've been given power. But Lovely didn't stop at power. 
He moves on to this next thing called love. You've been given an agape, an unconditional love to love people that you don't like. I think the problem we have in our society is we've bought this lie that if I disagree with you, then I have to hate you. Now, we, we say that that's not the case. But if we, if, if, if we checked our Facebook statuses, we would see the truth, amen, by who you like and who you love and, and who you block during election time. During who, who, you, who you, you, you uh, block their post for 30 days because you're tired of, it's quiet. It's quiet. I told this to my church too. Everybody left. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here's the reality, guys. He says, you've been given a, an ability to love humanity. So you can walk into the restaurant and have the worst waitress that's mean and rude, and she probably spit in your food, and go, I'm going to leave a good tip. Because see, love is not, true agape love is not about what I get. It's about what I have to give. He says there's a spirit. There's a charisma on the inside of you to love all humanity. Come on, somebody. There's a charisma on the inside of you to love people that treat you bad. I was talking to someone the other day, and they were, we were just talking about a situation, and they talked about a Judas. Like, you just got to be careful of them Judases. I said, Jesus had one. He never once kicked him out. He, you understand that? You ever thought about that? Jesus was walking in a crowd, and there's hundreds of people, and he goes, hey, you, Judas, come here. I want you to follow me. Now, that messes with me, because I'd be like, I ain't calling him God. He annoys me. <laughs> Jesus called Judas knowing Judas was going to betray him. See, there's a charisma on the inside of Jesus that allowed him to love Judas. There's a charisma on the inside of you that gives you the power to love your ex. To, 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 love, to love people that you really just can't stand. Are you with me? And then he does it in there. I love this. He says, not only that, but there's a, there's a charisma on the inside of you of power and love. And then he uses this terminology of sound of mind. The ability to control your mind, will, and emotion. I think you need to understand that the spirit of the living God is on the inside of you. People say, I just can't control my anger. Then my response is simple. You are not full of the spirit. Well, how dare you, Pastor Bo? I've prayed for the sick, and I've seen him recover, and I cast out demons, and, and they, they, they listened to him, and, and I did all this stuff. And in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, okay, that's fine, but depart from me. I never had communion with you. Man, if you can't control yourself, you need to get full of the Spirit. Not that we don't have struggles, because, again, I mentioned one of my struggles, and that's those, those road rage demons. In traffic? They'll cut me off, and my wife's like, you better chill out. You're a pastor. I'm like, that's why I'll never put a hill bumper sticker on my, on my truck. I may put a Baptist church or a Christian church or Methodist church so they think I'm from another church. Come on, somebody. But not my church. <laughs> For real. They got, the church got bumper stickers. Like, you want Pastor Bob? I was like, no. No way. Why not? Because I know me. Come on, somebody. I'm, try, I'm a working person. But the reality is, I know that my excuse will never fly with heaven and go, sorry, God, I just couldn't control it. And he was like, no, 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 no. That's baloney because I put it inside of you. I put inside of you the ability to control what you thought, to control your mouth, to control your mind. Come on now. I put inside of you the ability to control where your eyes go, where your feet go. Come on, somebody. He said, I put inside of you the gift, the charisma about all all things pertaining to life, you just chose to ignore it. You chose torment over peace because peace was in you. You choose anger over joy because joy was in you. Come on, somebody. See, if we'll allow this charisma to fill us, everything will change. Jesus was talking in Acts 1. He said, wait until Jerusalem until you're filled with the spirit of the living God and everything will change. Everything will change. He said, but wait for it. Because until then, you're going to have some struggles. I uh, have my milk with me. Anybody, anybody like milk? Come on, somebody. Milk is, a, milk is a good thing. Milk is a good thing. I got my milk with me. I like milk. I have a half a glass every night. 
before I go to bed. But my kids don't care for milk. My, my youngest son calls it just milk because there ain't no chocolate or strawberry in it. Amen. That's the truth. Daddy, I don't want just milk. I want chocolate milk. Matter of fact, he tried to get his own chocolate milk one day and spilled the milk all over the fridge. And he said, Daddy, he's three, uh, or just turned four, but he was three at this point. He goes, I made a little mess in the fridge. And I walked in, there was milk everywhere. Bless God. There was a gift in me called self-control that day. <laughs> Jesus said, I put, I put myself in, I put, this is you, I, I put my spirit in you. And, and, and you're this glass of milk, and this glass of milk is cute, and it's refreshing, and it's going to taste pretty good when I drink it here in a minute. Uh, in front of it, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it looks good, but the problem with this glass of milk is it doesn't have the ability to change anything in this room. This milk can try all it wants to. And it can't make you happy or sad. This milk can do everything. This milk can go, man, it's a little cold. I wish someone would would turn on. I wish the temperature would rise a little bit or it's a little hot. I wish it would come down. See, this milk is you and you're in this world, but you're not of this world. This this glass of milk is you and and, and you're in this world and you feel totally um, this inability to change anything you feel or face. But Jesus said something. He said, listen, you're this glass of milk and 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 you're in this world. He said, but listen, if you'll wait, I got something that's going to completely change your life glory to God come on somebody he said if you're if you wait and if you wait in Jerusalem I'm gonna put myself in you oh my God lay come on worthy of it all he said I'm gonna put myself in you and if you'll notice he said I'm gonna put my, I'm gonna fill you up and I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get it right on the side there he said I'm gonna fill you up and I'm gonna put my spirit inside of you and you are gonna have something in you that can change the way you taste come on somebody taste and see that the Lord is good come on somebody the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit are inside of you. There's something inside of you that can make all men want to be with you, all women want to be with you. Come on, somebody. There's something on the inside of you that can make everybody want to be right where you're at. But Timothy, it's dormant at the bottom. Timothy, there's peace inside of you. But it's dormant at the bottom. The problem with most Christians is this is us. We're chocolate milk. But all the chocolate's at the bottom. The problem with this milk, and if I were to pour another glass of milk, I should have brought in the glass of milk, was they would look completely identical. When the world looks at you, you don't look, you cuss just like them. You're angry just like them. You're divisive just like them. And they think, why do I want to go to your church? Just, I'm going to give my Sunday to see no difference between you and me? It's hard, man. He said, Timothy, you're preaching to thousands, and you're, you've got a great ministry. But the problem is, you have the same problems everybody else has. And you're acting the same way. There's no difference between you and a broken world. The, the only difference is the spirit of the living God. There's a charisma on the inside of you. He said, Timothy, there's a charisma. Whatever you need's in there already. It's just dormant at the bottom. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the, come on somebody, to stir up the gift of God that's inside of you. I know you going through hell, stir it up. I know you're angry, stir, I know you got sickness in your body. There's healing on the inside of you, stir it up. Come on somebody. I know there's depression on the inside of you. Oh, but there's peace coming, stir it up. I know there's division in your community. Oh, but you're a part of the reconciliation. Stir up the gifts of God that are inside of you. And then all of a sudden, everybody will look at you and go, wow, I want to be just like. (sighs) You. Oh, that's chocolate. This ain't ain't on your diet, Pastor (sighs) Tivia. It's not just milk anymore. All of a sudden, it tastes like heaven. And that's what they should say about you. It's not just Nicole anymore. It's not just Tina anymore. It tastes like heaven. It's not just Bo. It's not just Tom. Come on, somebody. It's not just Justin anymore. It's not just Jeff anymore. Uh, You know, I used to know Jeff, but now he's different. He said, Timothy, I need to instruct you, son. I know you want to quit, 
I know you think, why am I still serving? Why am I still doing these things? The problem is, you've let the good stuff settle at the bottom. Therefore, I remind you, to stir it up. I don't get to be angry with my wife. Why? I don't get to be hateful with people that hurt my feelings. I, someone that was talking bad about me, I got to love them even though I want to correct them. Come on, somebody. I got to love and call Judas even though he's going to betray me. The rest of the world can go through financial crisis, but I'm going to be okay. I, I refuse to die sick. I refuse to, oh, I'm in the world and it's been, 2020 has been rough, but for Pastor Bo and his family, why? Because in the midst of hell, I keep stirring heaven. Come on, somebody. In the midst of it all, I just keep stirring up the gifts of God and all of a sudden my outlook changes, my attitude changes, everything changes. So then the question. I got more stuff I want to talk about, but I won't because we're about out of time. I got eight seconds. The question is how? Because you know you can stir hatred. You can stir jealousy just like you can stir the Spirit of God. Right? You can stir dissension. You can stir trouble. You can stir it with gossip. We went from shouting to quiet. My bad, Pastor. I should have ended right there, huh? You can stir whatever you choose. Timothy, stir the charisma that God put in there. How? It's a great question. Philippians 4. I'm bringing this thing down. We're landing this plane. Philippians 4 verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever is true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatever is pure, whatever lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything worth praising, think on these things. He said, you need to, if, if, if you're going to stir the gifts, you got to change what you think about. You ready? Can I get personal? You need to turn off Fox and turn on Faith. You need to turn off CNN. You turn on Christ. Come on, somebody. Someone needs to turn off Post Malone and they need to turn on Praise. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Someone needs to turn off Whitetail Season and turn on Worship. Come on, somebody. He says, I, the problem isn't that you don't love God. I know you do. But you think on things that cause anxiety. Change the way you think. Pastor Bo, how do I change the way I think? Let me help you. Get some people in your life that will encourage you. Call the connect group. Come on, somebody. How do I change the way I think? Realize there's more to life than than all about you. Be a part of a serve team and serve with excellence. Sign up today. Come on, somebody. See, these are how I change the, the way I think in my life. Get involved. Be a part of the next steps. I, I, this isn't a plug. This is how we've done it. This is how I've been able to stir the gift of God. And even though it's been the hardest year of my ministry life, it's been the best year of my ministry life. I'm in the world. You're in the world. But I'm flavored a little different. How? Change the way you think. How? You ready for this? This is, this is, this is a crazy idea. Ask. Right? Luke eleven thirteen. Here's what it says. He says, yeah, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Spirit to those that ask? How do I stir the gifts? I simply ask. Come on, somebody. I simply ask God. Come on, somebody. I simply ask Him to move in my life. I simply ask Him. I put Him on the throne of my heart. I exalt Him, not my mind, will, and emotions. I put Him up. I make a demand upon His nature. And when I make a demand demand upon His nature, I understand He'll give it because He's already paid the price. He's already given it. I have ability to get my groceries. I just have to get the gift that He's already given me out of my pocket and take it to the store and get what I I need and pay for it. But here's the challenge. Everything I just mentioned are going to require steps on your part. One thing I've never had God do, I ask, I've been filled with the Spirit since the moment I was saved. So have you. And, and never once 
as he possessed my body and make me take steps that I didn't want to take. Peter is in the middle of a storm. There's waves. It says they tormented the boat. And he's like, we're going to die. After all this, Jesus left us. He called us to go to the other side and didn't come with us because he knew we were all going to die and he didn't want to die. That's the way you feel when you're alone and you feel like you're alone in the storm. Am I right? You feel like, why isn't he here? Where's he been? Why isn't he with me? Why am I going through this hell? Why am I, fr- why is my, my marriage struggling? Why is my finances in this mess? He's going through this storm and then they see a ghost and he's like, ah, it's a ghost. Amen. And Jesus speaks. Oh, don't worry. It's I. Don't be afraid. I love this story, y'all, because the whole time they were complaining that Jesus wasn't there. Jesus was already on his way. Come on, somebody. Matter of fact, he left the mountainside, I think, way before the storm ever appeared in the natural. Come on, somebody. Long before you ever facing what you're facing, he already was on his way to deliver you and to bring peace in the midst of the mess. Peter looks up. He says, I, it's a ghost. Jesus says, oh, it's I. Do not be afraid. And Peter says, if it's really you, call me. Call me. I I need to be with you. I'm afraid. I don't know what 21 looks like. I'm scared. I'm afraid my marriage is over. I'm afraid my, I'm afraid I'm going to go bankrupt. I'm afraid of being alone my whole life. I'm afraid my kids are going to rebel. I don't know your story. Call me, God. And this is when we get lost. Because then Jesus says, come. And we drop the spoon. And we back away. And we say, sorry, God. Because the storm's still raging. I'm afraid it's going to kill me. It's fascinating. In the boat, they thought the safest place he could have been, check this out, was on the water with Jesus versus in the boat with his friends. You think you got security over here. And God's going, no, that thing will go under without me. know you're scared. Come. I know you're afraid. Come. I know, I know you don't, I know you're going, if I trust you, what if it doesn't work out the way I want? It's okay. Pick up the spoon and take the step. Peter put his foot on the water. I'm convinced there was two places on that entire sea that were solid. That's where Jesus stood and that's where Peter stood. I think if anywhere else, fish were probably jumping. But Peter stood on what God had already said. And when we learn that we stand on the Word of God, it's stable. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what Paul is telling Timothy. There's something extraordinary about you. There's a gift inside of you. I know, there's a gift that'll bring hope. You may feel rejected, but no, no, no. There's a gift of acceptance on the inside of you. The problem that most of us, and Pastor T.W., I'm going to say, for me, my theology is this. The problem for all of us isn't that the gift isn't in there. It's that you refuse to stir it. And then we blame everybody else for our lack of taste. For our normality. Paul said, Timothy, you don't want normality. You don't want natural. You want supernatural. Paul said, Timothy, I know you want to quit. So I'm going to give you some advice that your mama has already taught you. Pastor Chevy asked me to come and asked me if I'd preach when I came. I said, okay, God. And I, I feel like he just challenged my heart to really encourage you guys. 
to continue to stir the gift. No more excuses blaming everybody else for your problems. Stir the gift. No more saying, I'll do the dishes, but COVID. No, 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 stir the gift. No more, no more, no more saying, well, they hurt me, so I'm going to, no, no, stir the gift. Stir the gift. Stir the gift. Stir the gift. Mm. Here's what I know about God. He put this charisma in you. And you can die never experiencing it. If you refuse to stir the gift. Justin, I don't know where you're at. We are in worship. And man, I was sitting over there and I've heard you lead several times and, and, and you and the team are great. But there was another level you stepped into today. Mm. And I just feel like in my spirit that the Lord's saying what you and probably have been in this season stepping into is it's really it's not maybe you see it as I'm starting to really get this pinnacle and I feel like God's saying no no this is the ground floor of where I want to take you yes father stir the gift but if we don't stir the gift we'll never experience it stir the gift stir the gift stir the gift thank you father God 2020 has been rough but I think it's been a, play, a season of shaking that's really bringing together a foundation of everything God wants to do. Mm. Stir the gift. Every vision and every declaration that God has spoken to this house, I believe, will come to fruition. And I think without the shaking, you couldn't build it correctly. Wow. So this is rebuilding. Come on, somebody. In your life, you're going to stir the gift. And you're going to bring your friends and your family. Come on, somebody. And they're going to experience and encounter God. Man, they're going to encounter God in a very real way. Wow. Stir the gift. Stir the gift. If you're here, and I'm going to turn this back to Pastor T.W. But if you're here, and you realize the charisma of God has been dormant in your life, and you're ready to stir the gift. When I count to three, I'm just going to ask you to stand on your feet. And I come out of this season not too long ago, so I'm already up. But you're really ready to stir everything that he's put inside of you. So that you can be not like the world, but be who he's called you to be. So that you can make it through the hard situations. So that you can have peace. So that you can have healing. So that the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit can flow through you. If you're ready, man, and, and, and the, the charisma has been dormant. It's been all laying to the bottom. And you're ready to stir it up. When I count to three, stay on your feet as we worship. Here we go. One, two, three. Right where you're at. Get on your feet. Come on, somebody. Lift your hands up. Come on, somebody. And begin to make the decoration in your own life. And Say, God, you can have every part of me. God, 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 you're worthy. You're holy. God, my hopes are yours. My dreams are yours. My joy, it's in you. My strength is in you. My, my, everything in my world is in you. You're worthy.